Activated. Analyzing. Update complete. What's up, Lore Masters? Real quick shout out to James from South Carolina. Word on the street is that you'll be going into retirement within a month. Congratulations, and I look forward to seeing you on the channel a lot more. With that out of the way, let's just get into it. The Klingon Bird of Prey, not that one, but this one, is the epitome of corporate greed showing how movie companies and TV execs wouldn't let a show innovate and grow, thus crippling some of the storytelling. The Klingon Bird of Prey, not that one, but this one, is one of the most iconic ships within the Trek universe. The successor to the Raptor class, the Bird of Prey was first seen active in the 2280s. Many have described the ship as versatile, a claim that I will dispute in the near future, but what I would agree on is that the ship is highly modifiable, and is ultimately the backbone of the Klingon defense fleet. The ship has several different models including scout, raider, patrol ship, and cruiser. Because, like in real life, when you have a scout ship, you can easily modify it into a cruiser. We don't know all of the designs of the model, but the ones we do know are Burrell, the much stronger Cavort class, and D-12. The D-12 was a particularly old model which had significant flaws, one of which allows the ship to be detected while cloaked, though I do question why this ship was retired given it could three-shot a Galaxy class. But Lord Reloaded! Lord Reloaded! They could penetrate the shields! Lord Reloaded! They could penetrate the shields! Yeah, and the shields on the Constitution class ship dropped in Undiscovered Country 2 and it took several shots, like a champ. Though, not to let logic get in the way of nerd rage. Yeah, yeah, kind of early to start taking pot shots in the breakdown, I get it, so let's be a bit more fair. Let's break down the duality of the ship. I find the Klingon Bird of Prey to be one of the Empire's greatest creations that ultimately became a symbol of the Empire's corruption, stagnation, and toxic view of honor. During the 23rd century, the vessel was a powerful ship, and one that would cause great fear in any foe that it came upon. It would be so feared that Starfleet captains of the same century would be intricately aware of the ship, including its capability and crew complement. Starfleet would seemingly train their captains on the strengths and weaknesses of this specific ship which isn't surprising given the Klingon Cold War. Oh, and that time when Starfleet was completely obliterated, but they never really bring it up in the 23rd century. Because quantum. Look, I really do like the design and makeup of the Klingon Bird of Prey, and the way that it was put together, structured, really fits the culture. It's a fitting successor to the Raptor class, and was rightfully a ship to be feared. It had a good mix of technology and a bite to it, the Klingons were rightfully an equal nemesis to the Federation in the 23rd century. And then, times changed, and the Klingons didn't. In all earnest, the early 24th century would show a time of stagnation for most all galactic powers in the Alpha Quadrant, but the Klingons would be the worst. While the Federation was stuck in its own stagnation and believing that it would now have peace in its time, the Klingon Empire sat back on their laurels and did nothing to innovate. They would try to fit different roles into the same design. They wouldn't branch out until the late 23rd century, and that was taking a D7 and making it into a Katinga ship, another old model. We wouldn't see true innovation until arguably the 2370s when the Vorcha-class vessel made its debut, and then on to the Negvar. That said, it can be understandable why the Klingons want to cling to the Bird of Prey. The vessel was fearsome and played a vital role in the traditions of the Klingon people. I intend to do a series that will break down entire cultures, but until that happens, let's take a brief look at the Klingon Bird of Prey and its impact on the Klingons themselves. The Klingon Bird of Prey ultimately would become the pride of the fleet. Its creation was at a time when all parts of the Klingon culture would be honorable, and thus the ship was lethally reflective of this. Unfortunately, as time went on, the same ship is reflective of the Empire's fall to corruption. When we first meet the Klingons, they seem to be nothing more than mustache-twirling villains, if I'm honest. But in the original series' movies, we start to see them as warriors with a code of honor. But not just warriors. The Klingons would consider tasks that serve the Empire to be honorable. No matter what you did, from janitor to engineer to the captain of the ship, if you did your job with honor and courage and made the Empire better for it, then you would be considered honorable and would go to Stovokor. This would mean that engineers would be honored as great tinkerers, as ones that could do almost anything. And then, the Klingons would progress into the next generation and into the series of Voyager, and it stopped being about being the most honorable you could be at your task. 
You had to be a warrior. Honestly, I believe this was reflected in Deep Space Nine a bit too. And because of that, you can see it in The Bird of Prey. Again, from a deadly, lethal ship to one they tried to make fit into roles that it was never designed for. Because nostalgia. They stopped designing better ships. They simply took what had worked historically and attempted to fit it into a mold that it wasn't designed. A scout ship that would be a good harasser of the Constitution class and able to be very, very lethal when traveling in packs would become a raider and ultimately a cruiser. Though, I will say the Klingon intelligence must have been top-notch to steal the Gallifreyan tech that it would take to make these ships work and keep the dimensions. Now that's also not to say that they didn't attempt to modify the ship, to change it in small ways so that when viewers were watching it on screen, the models looked different and thus they were continuing to be a cheap ass c Now that's not to say that they didn't attempt to modify the ship to make it better fit the combat necessities that were put upon it. They would change the wingspans depending on the situation. And of course the weapons could be modified or changed as well. And I will admit that the Kavort ship was very powerful during the era of the next generation, even in the Prime universe, not just yesterday's Enterprise. But without innovation, without upgrades, the Klingon Empire would greatly lag behind the Federation and other powers. In fact, I would argue that without the cloaking device, which the Federation willingly didn't innovate one of their own, the Klingon Empire would be no match for the Federation from the 24th century on. The creation of the Vorcha and Negvar would mean that the Klingon Empire would most likely be equal to that of the Romulan Star Empire, but the Empire would never really be a threat to the Dominion or many other powers, in my opinion. Though it was a bad time to be a Cardassian during the Klingon-Cardassian War. <sighs> okay, so I've talked a lot about the Bird of Prey and its impact at the galactic level, but from an internal perspective, the Klingon Bird of Prey was a symbol of Imperial might. For most of its time, it was something prestigious for the Klingons to serve on, even well into the 24th century and during the Dominion War. And the ship, more often than not, did bring honor to the Klingon Empire. Now I'm going to wait till next week to do a breakdown by class of the Bird of Prey, so I'm going to wait to look at the Burrell, wait to look at the Cavort class. Because if I was to do it now, I'd just list it and not get intricate. So you guys will definitely need to stay tuned next week as we go more into depth from a schematic perspective. Let me know what you guys think on my take of the Bird of Prey. Did it ultimately stagnate, or am I looking too deep into this? On that note, I want to do a shout out to all my subscribers and patrons. Without you guys, none of this would happen. Also, exciting news is that I'll be collaborating with Trek Yards in the next few weeks, so stay tuned for that. Also, don't forget you have a chance to win an Eagle Moss collectible, so comment below. Guys, don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you on the next Lore Reloaded.